Tonight, I want to begin with a uh, premise just to set the stage for the scripture we're going to be diving into. Tonight is a fun night, and I pray that we, we, d- we understand exactly what is being said. It might not be the best or the easiest topic to regurgitate or to, well, what's the word? Regurgitate's wrong from my side. Um, to take in, ruminate, that's the word I was looking for. But alas, to give you guys the premise before I make this even worse, um, God loves you. You guys believe that? Great, good stuff. God loves you. So whatever I'm going to say, can I just have that? Um, Nikita, uh, Stefan, can you ask me if you know Scrabe Nikita? My laptop's not working. Sheesh, bro. So there's no need to doubt this for one second. God loves you. And if you love someone else, you know that you want the best for that person. I gym with some uh, with two um, girls. They are iron ladies, and I just want to do an iron man with them. And they've been training me, and they constantly say, Steph, we love you. We want what's best for you. So therefore, you're going to suffer in the gym with us. Do you have someone like that in your life? Do you have a gym partner? Do you have someone that you really love? And maybe even like parents, you love them so much that you want what's best for them. It's only natural, right? Now, God loves us the exact same way. He wants what is best for us. And often, we might not see that very well because we live in this world. And this world is truly full of suffering. It's full of hurt. You know the code. I'm not going to say it out loud in front of everyone. Thanks, Stefan. Can you guys give a hand to that guy? It's still not switching on. (laughs) Thank the Lord. Anyway, I'm going to continue anyway. Tonight, we're speaking about a topic that Lenro kicked off last week. He kicked off a cool new series that's simply titled Fear No Fire. So if you were here last week, you know that Lenro spoke about Daniel and his or actually just Daniel's friends, and they were caught in the fiery furnace. Now, for those guys, we got the lesson that God saves us. He loves us, and therefore He saves us. And for them particularly, He saves them from circumstance. They were in a hectic situation, and God saved them from that. Now, we're speaking about fire in general. For the next two weeks and the three weeks in total, we're speaking about different imagery where God or the Bible uses God as a fire or God uh, seen through fire or in fire. And this will also be the evening service finale series for this year. And we are ending at the end of this month with the carols. It's going to be really fun. Last week, we spoke about a God who saves in the fire. This week, we're taking it to a next step. We're going to speak about a different kind of fire, a fire that burns to this day, one that wasn't back then or started back then, but burns all the way through history, burns in your life. And it's the fact that God is a God who sanctifies. He is a God who burns us with a fire that will test us in ways that sometimes hurts. So once again, God loves you. That's something we need to remember. Now, before we jump into Scripture, let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for all that you've done. Thank you for for bringing us here, and thank you for saving us. And I pray, Lord, that you show us what you want us to see in tonight. Lord, would you remove anything that is not from you? If it's from me or any other sort of influence, would you just protect us from that? And Holy Spirit, would you speak to us, prepare our hearts and our minds to what you want to say? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Amen. We're going to start in 1 Peter 1. So if you have your Bibles, you can go there. If you are following on the Version app, the event is there as well. 1 Peter 1, we're going to be touching on two main scriptures. 1 Peter 1 is one of them. Um, 1 Peter is a very cool introduction about what salvation means. Lenro spoke about it last, last week. Once again, God saves us eternally, and God also saves us from consequence. Now we're going to dig into what more that implies. 1 Peter 1, this free says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We just sang about that. And into an inheritance that can neither perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. 
Now, once again, God has saved us from eternal death. We have that hope, and we are kept safe until then. So Peter continues, verse 6, in all this, you greatly rejoice. And we do. We love it. That's an amazing fact. Amen. That is the gospel. It's a good thing. Next part of that verse, though now for a little while, you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Now, I feel a a modern day Christian would stop Peter right here and say, hey, speak life, not death. Why why are you doing that? What's going on here? Uh, This situation, let me clarify, Peter is not dooming us. He's not condemning us. He's not saying this is a curse to you. He's actually stating the obvious. In the context, Peter is writing to, to Christians found in the Roman Empire, and persecution was just starting. It was the beginning phase of persecution. They were not having a lot of fun. It was not great to be a Christian. And he writes this. To them... They have a God that loves them the same way that we have a God that loves us, and they know that. It is a God who saved them, but things aren't going well. So now they need to question, is God really God? Is He all-powerful? Does He really love us? Is He good? Is He even in control? And Peter knows this is what's going through their mind, so he writes this letter and he says, guys, I know it's happening. Let's continue, verse 7. These trials, these struggles, have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And this is where we involve that imagery of the fire. And the idea is that gold needs to be refined, it needs to be burned, it needs to be tested with extreme temperatures to be purified. Now, the Greek word for refined in that scripture is the same word used for genuineness. It means tested. Like gold that is tested by the fire, our faith is tested by our circumstance. Our faith is tested by the things that's going on around us. The trials, like fire, are not pleasant. They're not necessarily fun. If anything, it would cause people to wonder if God is in control or if there is a God at all. Yet, if we stand this test, Peter says, the result is praise, glory, and honor. Now, when we read this scripture, we need to understand that praise, glory, and honor, oddly enough, doesn't go to God, but goes to us. Now, that sounds a little weird, but Paul says the same thing. He says in Romans 8, verse 17, now, if we are children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we also share in his glory. We go from sinner to to saint. We go from outcast to being adopted into Christ's family. Now that means you become glorified, you get honor, and you get some sort of praise, even if it's a tiny amount in comparison to God's eternal amount, internal, eternal amount, an infinite amount. But notice this one thing, this one thing in that verse, the if indeed. Um, Nikita, if you could bring that up. Romans 8, that main section, if indeed. If you're Afrikaans, the old vertaling say, as. The new vertaling say, aangezien. And the 2020, which I suppose is the new, new vertaling, says, mit, which I suppose is not the thing you take things out of the oven with. Now, we may be quick to jump to the idea that it's awesome that we get to share with God's glory. That's awesome. But we miss the conditional. If indeed. If indeed we share in His suffering. Please don't misunderstand, as Christians, you don't have to go look for suffering. I think it's Dietrich Bonhoeffer that said, guys, suffering will find you if you're doing the Christianity thing right. It's going to come. Watch out. You just need to survive the test. Now, Peter writes to Christians, and he's saying, guys, survive this test. He says, though you have not seen him, speaking about God, you love him. And even though you do not see him right now, you believe in him, and you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. They believed even though they could not see him. And in the moment, it is hard to see God. In the moment of trials and suffering, even we know this, it's hard to see God's hand and his control. And yet they remained standing. They were receiving the end result of their faith, the salvation of their souls. God allowed them to experience the fire so that they may be tested and ultimately receive honor glory, and praise. Now, there's another piece of scripture that teaches the same thing, but it adds a lot more meat to the bone. 
The author of Hebrews in Hebrews 12 says this. You might know the scripture, Hebrews, Hebrews 12 verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. If you're a Christian, you've probably heard this verse before. It's very famous. It's something that we have preached from here a bunch. It's, it's something that pops up everywhere. The author of Hebrews gives us a task. Throw off the sin and anything that encumbers you, anything that weighs you down, and run this race called Christianity. Don't stop. And then he says, it's a struggle. It's, it's going to be hard. But we can look at Jesus as an example. He ran the race first, and he ran it best. We can follow him as an example. And then he goes into more depth. Verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted the point of shedding your own blood. Now, how intense is that verse? We're just running a race, but we need to understand the depth and the struggle of this race. It's hard to be a Christian. The author safely assumes that we've not resisted the point of shedding our own blood. He is only thinking that if you're reading this, you're not dead yet. Well done. So he's saying, you've not gone as far as to die for not sinning. But notice the next section, verse 5. Have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says this, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplined the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. I have no idea how to pronounce that. You guys may have noticed. We may often believe that God punishes us for our wrongdoing. We may feel like God is this cosmic policeman waiting for us to make a misstep. And it's like, you missed it again. That's not the case. Because if that was the case, that would be the other end of the prosperity gospel. Like God is waiting for us to do something good so he may bless us. And then he's waiting for us to do something bad so that he may curse us or punish us. That's not the case. If we believe that, we misunderstand grace. Grace is unmerited favor. You have not done anything to deserve God's blessing. He gives it freely and anyway. That's how it works. There's nothing you can do that will make God love you more or nothing you can do that will make God love you less. He gives you grace, unmerited favor. If you believe that God can punish you for certain sins, that means that Jesus dying on the cross was not good enough for that sin. And that's a lie. He has paid the price. He has taken all the punishment. But the gospel is clear. Jesus is good enough. What God does do, however, is he disciplines us. Does that involve some sort of punishment from our perspective? It might but it's not necessarily the sense. He is a loving father. He disciplines us for our good, like a father would do to a son or daughter. And we are sons and daughters of God. Expect discipline for your good. Does it involve punishment? We might see that, but it is for our good. So the author of Hebrews connects the dots and he says this in verse seven. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. The, the hardship that you're facing right now might just be proof that you are truly a son and daughter of God. The, the suffering that you're going through right now might just be evidence that you are a true son and daughter of God. And we are coming off the back of a sermon series where we spoke about how the enemy might attack us. Now, that could be another reason. But even in those moments, it has to pass God's desk. God knows what the suffering did to you. He knows what it could do to you. He knows what pain it will cause. And he weighs it up, and he understands that the good it will produce is better than the bad we might feel in the moment. So he allows it to happen. Moreover, verse 9, we have, all had, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? 
And this verse might be controversial. Uh, It might even become controversial in our time. My sister and I were brought up by godly parents who loved us and disciplined us in the correct way. And as kids, in the moment, it was never fun. But as adults, we look to them now and we respect them for it. My sister and I have volunteered at youth and young adults. And as a little side joke on the, when we're alone, we could tell which kids were not disciplined by their parents growing up. I'm sure you guys can too. Now, when we make those kind of jokes in our time, it gets out of hand. We're crossing lines. It's entering a taboo phase. And the reason for that is because there are some people who do not discipline their kids correctly or biblically or with a Christ's heart. And for that reason, all discipline is seen in a negative or bad connotation, just because some have taken it out of context. And when that happens, the enemy wins a tiny bit of ground. The enemy gets a foothold. Because some people may read this verse, and when they read it, they get a bad taste in their mouth because they know of someone or they themselves were abused as kids because of discipline done by people who were not godly. And when they see discipline, experience discipline, it does not lead to respect or submission. It actually only creates more rebellion. It creates a hard heart. Not so with God. He loves you. He wants what is best for you. He sees you as a true child of His. He wants to discipline you to make you more like Him. Notice how the author of Hebrews says it in verse 10. They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. They're human. They will make mistakes. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who are being trained by it. How awesome is that last part? Discipline creates a harvest of righteousness, and we are being trained by it. To say it in another way, the way Peter would say it, the fire that you're going through is going to result in praise, glory, and honor. The fire you're going through is bringing something good out of you which sounds logical, but it doesn't sound very pleasant. It doesn't sound great. It sounds like God is unkind, but He's not. He loves you and He wants what's best for you, and the best thing for you in all of this earth can offer is for you to be more and more like Jesus. That's what God wants. So when you look at Hebrews and when you look at Peter, you'll see that both of them end similar. At the very end of 1 Peter 1, it says this, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. A few verses later in Hebrews 12, it says the same thing. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, it is impossible to see the Lord. Big and scary verses. The best thing for you is to be holy. So like a loving father, God knows what is best. And at the risk of sounding controversial, because we live in a world that puts emphasis on the here and now, it puts emphasis on our independence and our freedoms and our happiness, God is more interested in your holiness than your happiness. God is more interested in how you are like him than how happy you feel about what you have right now. And if it were up to us, If it were up to happiness from our perspectives, we would not go into a fire. We wouldn't go into a struggle. We wouldn't try and go into trials. We would avoid it all. But that doesn't change us. It doesn't transform us. It it spoils us. It, It leaves us clinging to entitlement, and we are not pursuing holiness. But God sees past the here and now. He sees past what we want because he knows the abundant life that he's going to give us. He knows what we need. He knows how to give gift, good gifts to those who ask him. So he will. He's not in the business of making us miserable. He's not going to allow us to go through unhappiness for nothing or for no reason. He knows what he's doing. He's got a purpose with all of this. God puts us into the fire, and we can fight and kick against it, or we can embrace it. We can embrace the fire for the good that it brings. So how do we do that? Looking at 1 Peter 1 and Hebrews 12, there are three main points that we can discuss on how to embrace the fire. 
Firstly, both authors make a very strong appeal for us to see our trials and see our discipline in a good light. So point number one, see the good. See what God is doing here. This is a call for us to change the way we think. We're not just looking at struggles as punishment anymore. We need to see God in His correct way as God. He loves us. He's not biased. He's not sinful. He's not spiteful. He doesn't want some sort of revenge. He's not trying to prove a point. He loves us and He wants what's best for us. He is all-powerful, loving, and He has a purpose with our hardships. We need to believe that. When we do, we get to reinterpret our suffering and understand that God is busy doing something with our lives. He's busy putting us through something to make us into someone. No suffering or discipline is pleasant at the time. But if we understand the purpose, we understand the meaning behind it, we get the reason. It is making us holy. It's sanctifying us. It's making us more like Him. Who, by the way, also suffered. Jesus suffered. And we have Him as an example the author of Hebrews says, look to him who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Jesus had perspective. Not only did he understand the purpose of suffering, he understood that eternity far outweighs the suffering of the here and now. It's something we see in the New Testament time and time again. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 4. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. In Romans 8, he says it this way, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. With that understanding of purpose and perspective, we understand that what we're going through right now cannot compare to Christ and it cannot compare to eternity. What you're going through right now, no matter how big, cannot compare to what the glory is that will be revealed in you. Which leads us to point number two, endure the bad. The author of Hebrews quotes Proverbs 3, and this is what the original verse says. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke. In other words, he says, don't hate this, which, to which I reply, have you tried this? It's not fun to go through this stuff, so why not? Why not hate the fire? Why not hate the suffering? Why not hate the depression? Why not hate the low income? Why not hate the place where I'm at? Why not hate the anxiety? Why not hate this desert period? Why not hate the waiting? And God says, I'm busy. Because if you don't go through the desert and if you don't go through the fire, you won't be made into me. There's very little you can learn in comfort and in success. Sometimes we need a desert to change us into who we need to be. Sometimes we need a fire to burn off what we've been holding onto for far too long. We need purpose. God is doing something great in you. He is making something in you that is not worth measuring to the suffering you're going through right now. And perspective, no suffering that you have compares to eternity. So don't try and rush your waiting period. Don't try and get out of the fire. I love how Lenro said in his sermon last week, vandal and fear. There is no English for that. There is no English for vandal and the fear, but I'll cr try and capture the essence. Chill there for a while. It's nice. Have fun. Endure the moment. And while you do so, point number three, produce a harvest. Now, this is something that happens organically. If you put gold in a furnace, it will be refined. If you become a Christian, you enter this process where you will begin bearing fruit, but we need to be intentional. It's something that we're going to observe in each other's lives. It's something that we'll witness happening, but we need to be intentional about everything. The way Peter and the author of Hebrews says it is we need to strive for holiness. It's a command. It's not just something that will happen. We need to try our best. We need to make every effort to live in peace and to be holy. And be holy, how holy? As He is holy, the ultimate standard. It's a standard that calls for a lot of effort. It's something we need to be conscious of as often as we can. Without having the idea of a harvest in mind, we're never going to see the good. Without having the idea that we are producing something in ourselves, there's no way that we're going to be able to endure the bad. But once we see the outcome, once we see the fruit and the gold, it becomes easy to see the good. It becomes easy to endure the bad. And it becomes natural and organic to produce a harvest. So band, would you guys please join me on stage as I close. Last week, um, Lenro 
also concluded his sermon in a very cool way uh, while speaking about Daniel's friends in the furnace. Uh, actually, before they get to the furnace, Leonard makes a cool point. He says they could fearlessly stand in front of a fire because they feared the Lord more than what they did the fire. They understood that the fire outside of the furnace was burning a lot hotter than the one inside of it. 1 Peter 1 and Hebrews 12 says the same thing. 1 Peter 1 says it this way. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Peter understood that a holy God deserves a level of reverence and fear. And if you check what that word fear means, it means terror. It means that when you understand who God is, there is a natural reaction within you. You freak out. Peter understood that the fire inside of the furnace, a fiery furnace, is cooler than the fire outside of it. Hebrews 12 says it this way, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. I love this verse. For our God is a consuming fire. With a correct perspective, we can be thankful. With an understanding of salvation, we can be thankful. No matter the suffering, the pain, or the fire, the kingdom we are receiving cannot be shaken. So our response, let us worship Him appropriately. What is appropriately? It's not entitled. It's not uh, spoiled. It's one where I say, God, I'm coming in reverence and awe of who you are, and I'm going to worship you. I'm going to be holy. Why? For our God is a consuming fire. Once we understand that, once we feel that heat, we experience the fires of our trials in a weird comparison. It becomes cool. It becomes easier. Once we understand the standard to which God is holding us, the person we are changing into becomes all the more valuable than the, te- the trials that we're going through. Don't fear the fire of suffering. Don't fear the fire of the Lord's discipline. It's a product that will be produced in you what is far more valuable than what we're holding on to. And that may be really, really easily said and done. It's easy to read these verses and like, okay, Steph, I get it. Be positive. Think positively. Look at the end in sight. Cliches. But the truth is very close. There's something that we might be holding on to. There might be idols in our lives that we might be unconsciously or subconsciously worshiping. There might be things that we hold into greater esteem than God. The, the call for holiness in our world is so countercultural that it requires a fire to shake us. Uh, the, the call to love what God loves and then to hate what He hates is crazy. I was in a conversation this weekend with people uh, where just because COVID came, they started watching shows they wouldn't usually watch because COVID came. And I don't blame them. I don't necessarily think they're bad people or anything like that. I just think, wow, the pressure of society to allow these natural things to step over boundaries that we should be guarding with our lives. We need to understand there's a fire that's burning. And I pray that fire for holiness burns inside of you so that it redetermines what you listen to, what you watch, what you do. And I love how Jesus says, because we, when, once we start drawing those lines, we start separating ourselves from the world, and not in a sanctifying kind of way, but in a very humanistic kind of way. We want to live in a hermitage. We don't want to get close to the world. Jesus says, it's not what goes into you that defiles you, but what's, what comes out. But notice how your influences cause your heart to change. Watch and guard yourself closely. Allow the fire to burn. So when you go through trials, look at it and see it as discipline. See the good. See what it is producing. And once you're in it, endure the hardship with the knowledge and understanding that I am truly a son of God. I know he's allowing this. I know he's allowing this for a purpose. I'm not going to run. I'm going to take every single moment because I know what is being produced. And then once you do, produce that harvest. Allow that fruit to come. Allow the goal to stand the test so that we can stand the test and we can receive praise and honor and glory to be known as sons and daughters of God. We stood the test.
if you're here tonight and it is difficult, not just in the sense of like, it's always difficult. No discipline is easy or pleasant. But if you're here tonight and you've been going through some sort of a struggle, if you've been going through some sort of trial, even if it's a minor thing that you only recognize now as a fire burning, something that's being created in you, and you're struggling to bear the weight, I want you to know that you're not alone. God has sent His Spirit to be your comforter and to be your help. You have God on your side. He is with you in the fire, and He is with you while you're becoming more and more like Him. But God didn't stop there. He has placed you in a community of people who are going through similar problems. And He says, if you have a burden you cannot bear, give it to the people around you. Bear each other's burdens as each of us carry our own load. Don't keep this to yourself. So if you're here tonight and you're carrying some sort of a burden that came through some sort of a trial, I'm not doing this because of habit. I'm not trying to do this to single anyone out. I'm trying to do this to say, you're not alone. If you're here tonight and you're busy standing in a furnace that is sanctifying you and you're struggling, it's not because you're weak. God is pushing you to a place where he wants to create something inside of you. And if you're struggling, if that's you tonight, would you please stand? I'd like to pray with you. And as is the habit, if you are near people that are standing, would you please lay a hand on their shoulder? Jesus, you are working in each and every single one of our lives. We are all being tested in some sort of fire, but for those who are standing here tonight, who are struggling under the weight of their trial and their burden, I pray, Lord, would you just comfort them? Would you give them strength? Would you help them? They are reaching out, Lord. Would you reach back? And we know that is the truth. When we draw near to you, you draw near to us. And Lord, we are drawing near to you tonight. And we're saying, Lord, forgive us for when we're missing the point. Forgive us when we want to run out of the fire. Give us the ability to vundle any fear. Give us the ability to chill here for a moment, to embrace this moment, to understand that it's producing a harvest that will give us righteousness and result in praise, glory, and honor. And Lord, we don't want praise, glory, and honor to ourselves. That is, that is nothing in comparison to the glory that we are producing for you. So Lord, I pray right now for those lives that are standing right here tonight, would you help them to glorify you more and more for hearts that are broken that can't take any more I pray, Lord, would you just give them comfort? Would your love be so tangible? Would it surround them? For, for minds that feel like they're lost, that feel like they're in some sort of a mist, would you give them clarity? Would you be their beacon so they can follow you? Lord, for those who are just tired, I pray that you rejuvenate them with an understanding that you're with them and you have gone before them. Lord, I pray for each of us who are still here tonight who are, might be sitting and undergoing for some sort of trial. I pray, Lord, would you just be with us? Would you comfort us? Would you hold your hand around us? And would you glorify yourself in all that we do? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For everyone else, would you guys please stand? We're going to close with one more song. When we preach about holiness, it is a fairly unpopular topic. But this is what we're all about. God's primary characteristic is holiness and we need to become like Him. And I pray He reveals that to you guys. I pray that when we see a glimpse of that, we might react like Isaiah and John, that when they see a holy, holy, holy God, it just changes us.